Hi everyone, my name is Lindsay. I am a teen services librarian here at the Tom's River branch of the Ocean County Library. We are joined by the brilliant artist Stephanie Singleton here today. Um, and we wanna thank you for joining us virtually. Um, so let's get into Stephanie's presentation and allow her to introduce herself today. Okay, hello, my name is Stephanie Singleton and I'm a freelance illustrator that lives and works in Toronto, Canada and sometimes Stockholm, Sweden, which I am currently. These next couple of slides are some examples of my personal work, client work, and book covers I've done over the years. So these are some personal pieces I've done. I think they range from 2019 to this year. I created these just for fun in my free time, not for clients or anything. This next slide is some of the client jobs I've worked on. So from left to right is LA Times, uh, an album cover for an independent artist, BuzzFeed News, and the large one at the bottom was done for Science Magazine. And these are some of the book covers I've worked on over the years. Opposite of Always was the very first book cover I ever did, so it holds a special place for me. And there's Black Enough, uh, Before the Ever After, Early Departures, The Voting Booth, and Red Dogs. So, a little bit about me. I grew up in Scarborough in the east end of Toronto with Jamaican American parents that had recently immigrated to Canada. It's a cliche, but I started drawing and making art at a young age and I was able to further progress within the public school system, mainly because I went to an art focused high school. And this really enabled me to have access to materials and courses I would not have otherwise. After high school, I attended OCAD, the art university here in Toronto or back in Toronto since I'm not there right now, but for graphic design and not for illustration. At the time, I figured graphic design was a more financially stable option to pursue, but I ended up hating the program so much I wanted to drop out. A teacher ended up convincing me to switch programs and I graduated a few years later with a Bachelor of Design with a illustration focus. And following university, I worked in retail and eventually at the Toronto Public Library to support myself while I worked on my illustration career part-time. When I was just starting out as an illustrator, I barely had any client work. So in the meantime, I tried to create portfolio pieces post my work to social media as much as I could and reach out to art directors. And things eventually started to pick up a bit. And three years after I graduated, I quit my library job to go full time. I hadn't become fully financially stable at this point, and it was a bit of a risk. But by chance, I started working for a client that would continuously hire me for nearly a year, which really helped me out in the beginning. And I've been a full-time freelance illustrator ever since then. So it's just been over five years now. And now I wanted to do a brief run through of what my job looks like and how I create art. So art supplies and the process I go through when I'm working on a client project. So to start a potential client will contact me by email. Sometimes they'll wanna do a call or a Zoom meeting but it is really rare. We'll discuss the brief, timeline, specs, and budget. And once we're both in agreement, they'll send me a contract to look over and sign. Sometimes with books, they will also send a manuscript as well, but not always. At this point, I'll move on to rough. I usually like to provide at least three for each assignment. And the author will oftentimes provide a specific description of the characters for me to follow. And I'll also use the brief, which usually has like a synopsis of the story or the manuscript itself to come up with ideas. And roughs are usually just line art and in black and white, although that can change if I'm on a tight timeline. So on screen, these were the roughs I did for early departures. I think the main concepts that the art director wanted to get across, if I remember correctly, were the passage of time, boundaries between and boundaries between life and death, which is a bit more abstract and heavy than the white covers I normally do. But I really loved working on this cover. I think it's probably one of the, like my, my most favorites I've ever done. And this might've been on a shorter timeline because I think these were in color. 
These also are done in color, but in the end, the middle rough was chosen with a few small tweaks and a new color palette. So once the roughs are completed, I'll send them over to the art director. And after a period of time, they'll get back to me with the option that they like best and any revisions that they want me to make. I find book covers usually have a bit more back and forth with revisions and changes than other illustration jobs. And I think this is probably because there are more people that have to look over and approve the final design, such as like the author, the author's agent, editor, sales team, etc. cetera. Uh, once a rough is approved, I'll create color roughs, which are essentially colored versions of the rough sketch. And this is in order to help everyone involved get a better idea of what the final art will look like. After one is chosen and approved, I am able to move on to the final. So on screen, these were some of the color roughs I did for early departures. And in the end, the middle option was again chosen. So once I get the approval to go to final, I create final files with a mixture of Photoshop, Procreate, and traditional media. And I'll talk more about how I create art and book covers specifically now. So these are the art supplies I use. I have definitely streamlined them over the years. I don't really try out new art supplies very often, especially when it comes to client work. So I use Arsha's watercolor paper, paint brushes, Speedball India ink, uh, Light Table, uh, MacBook Pro, my really ancient Wacom bamboo tablet, just a regular Epson scanner, a pencil, and an iPad Pro and Apple Pencil. I start by sketching the liner on Procreate. I find working on Procreate and the iPad feels the most natural for digital sketching, and it's easier to make changes this way. And this is especially helpful when doing client work, since you know at least some minor tweaks will be needed. I then create <clears throat> color roughs using Procreate. Once everything is approved at the rough stage, I print out the Procreate sketch and trace it onto watercolor paper with the light box I mentioned previously. I ink liner and create washes and shading in grayscale with ink and then scan it into my computer. After that, I add color on top of the black and white liner with both Procreate and Photoshop. I tend to switch back and forth between the programs since they each have aspects that the other lacks. It's not really the most effective way to work and maybe one day I'll only need to use one program, but for now, this is what works for me. So in this slide, the farthest image to the left is what a typical sketch in Procreate looks like, which I will then print out and trace after it is approved. The middle image is what the illustration looks like once I have inked the liner and added washes and shading with India ink. And the final picture is how the final piece looks when color has been added with Photoshop and Procreate together. So final touches are made in Photoshop and then I will upload the file to a transfer service such as WeTransfer and send it over to the client. Sometimes there are small tweaks that need to be made to the final, but since this is such a long process with the rough, the changes are usually really minimal. And once it is all approved, I will send over an invoice to get paid and that's it. That's a typical job process overview for me. So I hope you enjoyed that brief look into my process and we will now move on to the interview portion. That is fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. It's so interesting to learn about a world where we have no experience in and getting a glimpse into your day. So that's awesome. And I had no idea that you were in the library world. So what a coincidence that we asked you to speak today. <laughs> I originally wanted to be like, I wanted to stay in the library system, but it was just too, I wanted to do archival work, but there were so few jobs in it that I decided that I probably couldn't do it. So let's talk a little bit about um, your creative process. So do you have a routine when you're creating? Is it something where you're, you're really into uh, creating at night or in the morning when you wake up? Or do you have any, any little favorite uh, habits that you do when you're creating? Um, I am definitely not a morning person. <laughs> I would say that I get going creatively most often after the sun goes down. Uh, especially if I have to do uh, rough work coming up with ideas, like the ideation process goes a lot better for me after dark. But if I have to do like um, creating 
final pieces is more of like a mechanical process for me. So I can do that at any time of the day. But if I'm making roughs or creating new projects, it has to be usually at night. That's fair. I can relate to that. I do not function well in the morning, so <laughs> don't blame you. <laughs> do you have any illustrative inspirations? Do you have any artists that you adore or things of that nature? I do. I mean, when I was in school, Richie Pope was a big inspiration for me because he was one of the first big Black illustrators that I can remember ever existing in like contemporary illustration. Um, I also really like Manjit Tapp. Uh, Charles Chasson also does really nice book covers. And I think her name is Noah Demona. I forget her name. I'm so sorry, but she's also <laughs> really good. Understandable. There's so many artists out there, but it's wonderful uh, that you have some people that you can bounce off of and know that like that's where you get your inspiration from. Um, now, I've also noticed in your designs, now, when you did your, your examples and your presentation, I didn't see as much of this, but I noticed that you use a lot of bright, vivid color. Do you use color to tell a story? Do you have, like, bright colors that you lean on? Um, or is that just a coincidence? <laughs> I don't know if it's a coincidence, but for some reason, I am really drawn to using bright colors. I am not really sure why, because when I was in university, I did mostly monotone work and I didn't use color at all because I was kind of afraid of it interesting and once I started working more digitally I think it really allowed me to experiment more with color because it's a lot more freeing if you mess up traditionally it's hard to change colors alter things in any way so once I started working digitally I started to experiment more with color and for some reason I'm really drawn to using bright colors I don't really know why <laughs> I can't really <laughs> well, that it. makes sense like when you use like super bright colors or even like colors that aren't traditional and I think you can tell a story and make things that feel like concrete and black and white look more dynamic so I like that you say that <laughs> <laughs> um so I see that you've done some other articles um and things of that nature you've done creations outside of book cover work um is there anything else that you have in your portfolio that's interesting do you ever do any like um, physical mediums like canvases things of that nature I haven't really worked with traditional media very much since I graduated from university and I kind of want to do that more in the future but it's just so easy with digital art to change and alter things so I and usually if you're doing client work as well it just makes a lot more sense to have a digital component because they're always going to want changes and I think things look a lot better printed usually once they're run through Photoshop or another um, digital application. So I would like to do wallpaper one day. Ooh. Everybody's told me like, why don't you try making wallpaper? But I can see that. I don't, really, <laughs> I don't really know. Like that's a different world altogether. I really only know the publishing world and I do editorial sometimes, but licensing and design and pattern work is a completely different world that I don't really know that much yet. So maybe one day just putting that out there. <laughs> to do wallpaper. <laughs> Manifest it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, while you talk about um, your work with publishers, uh, let's get a little bit into your career um, and books specifically. Uh, now, I know you said that you work with someone who really introduced you into the world of like book covers and things of that nature. Um, how does that work? Is that like the person who you work with gets the work for you? Do you reach out to authors and publishers? Um, what does that look like? So usually it is an art director from a publishing house reaching out to me on behalf of the author and the agent. There is a whole process that I am not really privy to beforehand. They even reach out to me. So I think I'm speculating on this, but I think they gather a few illustrators that they're, il they're interested for for the book cover. And I think the author goes over and I guess, I don't know if they um, really select people or I don't know if they vet people in any way, but it's like a process with the art director, the editor and the author's agent usually. Um, and then once they have decided on, I guess their top picks for the book cover, they will reach out to illustrators and I guess see who is available, who's not. So usually it's an art director that emails me and the art director is the only person I usually talk to 
the entire process. They will relay information to me from the author because the author, I guess, looks at the book cover as well at every aspect and put, has their input as well. So it's just me and the art director usually that go back <laughs> and forth through email. Well, speaking of authors, you've done quite a bit for Justin A. Reynolds. Have, has that become like you've become one of his favorite go-to cover artists or does he just like privy to your artwork or do you just really design like designing for him? Is there just like a like an artistic relationship there or just chance? <laughs> it was complete chance because I think he was the very first book cover author, like the first author I ever did a book cover for. And it was his first book as well. So it was kind of a nice thing there. He was a debut author and it was my first book cover. And then I happened to do his second book, but I think that was just like completely by chance as well. I'm not sure if he put in a word that he wanted me to do the second cover, but I also did a promo image for Opposite of Always as well, because he reached out to me separately after I did the first cover. And it was super nice. I don't know, <laughs> it's just really nice to have like, when authors really like your work and then they reach out to you and it just makes me feel so nice that they like how I've represented their characters and gotten across like what they have wanted for their book. So yeah, what a great really nice feeling. <laughs> it is such a nice feeling, yeah. <laughs> um, how important is it to you to ensure that your portfolio is diverse or do you get a say in that? Um, I don't get a say, well, I mean, I don't know why I said I don't. <laughs> I get I get a, like I completely get a say in what I put in my portfolio. I don't get a say in say the jobs that I get and usually the authors have ideas of what they want their characters to look like already, but I always have when I was a kid I would have wanted to see people that looked like me or other more diverse people represented in YA covers and I think that it's just so nice that I get to illustrate books like that now so I always try and draw people that I feel look like me or kind of re represent me in a certain way or people that are similar like yeah similar to me so I guess I, it's not really a conscious decision that my portfolio is diverse it's just what I feel I guess represents me if that makes any sense no, it makes perfect sense. And that's great that you feel like you now have this uh, methodology of mirroring yourself to other people and showing other people um, that they can see themselves in cover. So I love that. Um, do you gravitate towards YA literature? I know that a lot of your covers have been YA. You've, you've gone into J a little bit as well, uh, juvenile, mm -hmm. but do you find yourself gravitating that way? Honestly, none of this was like my doing. It kind of picked me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was the first, when I first started getting book covers, I don't really know why I got the first covers I did. I believe they saw my work online, but I had never done any sort of similar work for publishing or anything like it before. So I guess they just thought, the art director thought that my work fit YA, even though I wasn't really consciously trying to make work for YA. It just kind of happened. And I think as well, with adult books, they're not so illustrative. Like, there's not as many illustrators that work in adult books. So it's mainly YA, juvenile, and children's books if you want to illustrate covers. You can do adult covers, but it's not as likely. Yeah, you make a good point. That is a lot less common. Like, I, I didn't think about it before I wrote that question, but you really don't see that many illustrative adult covers. And I bet you that when you do, people do assume they may be to a younger audience. So that's a very good point. But I don't understand that. Do you adults, yeah. like, I, I would like to see more illustrated adult covers. I don't understand, like, why it's not really a thing. Yeah. And you know what? I think for like uh, adult fiction, for, uh, for instance, it's kind of hard. I know for me as a 20 year old to find uh, characters that are often in their 20s or 30s. And I feel like sometimes graduating that illustrative into adult fiction might be able to hit that demographic and made it more identif uh, able to identify to the community. I don't know. But uh, you make a very good point. <laughs> Maybe in the future that will change because YA covers definitely have changed over the past like 10 years as well. Cause before they used to use so much photography and I think it was in the last 
I don't know, five or so years that they started really doing a lot of illustrated covers. So maybe a little change in the future. Maybe, maybe you'll change it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What are your creative goals for the future? Now, I know some things you don't have a say in, but if you had the perfect view of what you would like to work on in the future, would that be books? Would that be um, editorial? Would that be, what would that look like for you? Um, I always like to do a mixture of things because I don't like to do the same things all the time, which is what I really like about being an illustrator. So a good mixture of things is always something I would strive for. But I kind of want to try and do a children's book eventually in the future. I don't think it's going to be anytime soon, but I think it would be really fun to illustrate a book. And I do still want to make wallpaper. That is one thing I want to try more like design pattern work. I guess I just want to try different things that I haven't done before. And I still like illustrating book covers. So that can be (laughs) something as well. That's awesome. Now, if you are talking to someone who is younger and wants to kind of follow in your footsteps and explore a little bit creatively, would you have any advice in getting connected with, uh, say, somebody who is an art director who may be able to get them those, these kind of opportunities, or does it kind of just fall in your lap? <laughs> yeah, I kind of think working in illustration is a mixture of perseverance and luck, because I honestly don't really know how a lot of people have found me. I think mostly through the internet, but I'm not really sure. Um, But some advice, I would say, I guess you could reach out to publishers, but it's really difficult because they probably get so many inquiries every year. But I would say to be persistent and to put your work out on social media, have a website, have a portfolio. I think that's really important for people to look over, like not just have an Instagram account, but actually have a portfolio website. So you have a certain place where people can look at your work in depth. Um, Yeah, and I guess there are sites that kind of collate different illustrators. So I know there's one like Women Who Draw, I have gotten work a lot of work there I think I I think (laughs) if I I should probably ask art directors where they find me but sometimes I just but like especially if I'm working with somebody for the first time I feel like it's a little bit of like a rude question to ask right away and then at the end I always forget so (laughs) and you also could go the route of getting an agent I know some friends of mine that are illustrators that have literary agents, I guess that really helps in the publishing industry, especially if you want to work with children's books. I know you just like definitely need a literary agent, but I guess be persistent and it's hard. Don't give up (laughs) because it takes a while sometimes. Like it takes a few years, at least I would think. Most people don't make it right away. I know some people that have, but it's not really the norm. I could see how like that's a very saturated field. So getting the opportunities and sometimes striking striking gold, you know, sometimes can be difficult, but it is possible. (laughs) It's definitely possible, yeah. um, How has social media helped you? Have you found, like I actually found you through Instagram. Do you find that that's something that you've been able to curate an audience or maybe is that because of some of the work you've done? Is it again, luck? It, It, How do you feel that social media helps you? I don't know for, because I am not great at social media. I am not very consistent on social media. I think that when I was consistent was probably when I was just starting out and I did not have much work because then I had time to post all the time, kind of follow people, be more active community-wise. And now I find like I don't really have the time to even go on Instagram very much or anything else. I think I have gotten work through Behance, which is like the social media site that no one really (laughs) uses. And I don't even really use it very often. I don't have many followers on there, but I've gotten like quite a few jobs through Behance, which is the Adobe portfolio website. So I would try Behance. Um, I think there are a lot of like our professionals on there. I don't know how many jobs I've gotten through Instagram, to be honest. I don't think that many, 
Um, I've gotten work through Twitter, even though I don't even use Twitter. Like I did barely. <laughs> <No. have. laughs> <laughs> like I have an account I don't really use it but I've gotten work through it and I've definitely gotten work through other jobs that I have done so people have seen previous things I've done and then reached out to me afterwards so I would say the most jobs I've gotten are through Behance and maybe Instagram but I don't really know how many through Instagram to be honest I think Instagram can be really useful if you want to be more of like a social media artist that you want to have like an online store or have a Patreon and you want to cultivate an audience that way. I think that followers then could mean a lot, but working in publishing and stuff, I find I don't think it means so much the amount of followers you have on Instagram and other platforms. That's fair. Absolutely. Um, so a um, little bit more of a couple fun questions. How do you overcome okay. uh, creative blocks? Like if you if you get assigned a project and you're like, this idea is a little abstract, how do you overcome that? Uh, usually I will, I guess, write the idea down and then leave it and go do something else. Usually I'll figure out the idea. It comes to me randomly in flashes when I'm not thinking about the project. So that usually helps. The shower helps <laughs> a lot when I'm stuck. And also doing other creative things that don't have to do with illustration, like seeing a movie, going for a walk, just getting away from the studio or wherever I'm working really helps. And I guess there's another thing I can't, you kind of have to work through creative block. You don't really have a choice when you're doing illustration as a job because you are on like a finite timeline. So I guess even if I don't have great ideas, I will just throw out ideas if I really can't think of anything. Just whatever. Well, at least you get practice elimination then. They could say, oh, I don't yeah, like exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. Because even if you have ideas that aren't so great you will get feedback from the art director and they could if you are working with a good art director they will help you cultivate like a better solution awesome um so what is your favorite um do you have something when you're creating that is a companion whether it's a cup of tea or a favorite snack or a pet like what do you always have with you when you're designing uh coffee <laughs> definitely <laughs> coffee <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing else that's consistent but coffee. <laughs> now, my last question that I have for you, what is your least favorite thing to design? Like I hear so many people say hands are like the worst thing to draw. What is your kryptonite? <laughs> Probably mechanical objects because I love organic, natural things. And I like drawing people as well, but just cars, computers, anything man-made I it's not my favorite thing to draw definitely lots of straight line anything with lots of straight lines not my favorite <laughs> that's fair <laughs> so don't be like a tattoo artist <laughs> with lots of straight lines no no I mean like I have tattoos but I would never I could never be a tattoo artist it's completely different tattooing on skin than drawing on paper oh I can only imagine <laughs> yeah well, I want to thank you so much today for joining us. This has been fantastic and getting a peek inside your world um, and seeing what you get to do and create. And, and these covers are just, I keep looking at them. I've had them on my desk while I have a display up in the library and they're just so colorful and eye-catching. And we're so glad that we were able to get you for this conversation today. Um, so if you, is there any last words that you'd like to share with our audience? Uh, I don't think I have anything, but just thank you for having me. It's been really nice to talk to you. Absolutely. Um, so for the patrons who are watching at home, uh, we do have another presentation coming up on January 20th with David Curtis, who's done covers for The Kingdom of Back by Marie Lu, uh, designs for uh, Claire Legrand. So we also have another wonderful illustrator if you want to get a peek into his world as well. Um, so thank you so much. All right, and have a good night. Support public libraries, like, share, and subscribe for more great videos.